Welcome to Intermediate Chapter 7 as we begin talking about cash and cash receivables. Cash includes currency and coins, balances and checking accounts, and items acceptable for deposit in these accounts, such as checks and money orders received from customers. These forms of cash represent amounts readily available to pay off debt or to use in operations without any legal or contractual restriction. Cash equivalents include money market funds, treasury bills, and commercial paper. To be classified as cash equivalents, these investments must have a maturity date no longer than three months from the date of purchase. Companies are permitted flexibility in designating cash equivalents and must establish individual policies regarding which short-term, highly liquid investments are classified as cash equivalents. A company's policy should be consistent with the usual motivation for acquiring these investments. The policy should be disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. This slide shows a note from the 2015 Annual Report of Walgreen Boot Alliance Inc., which operates the largest drugstore chain in the United States. An overview of accounting for cash should include a discussion of internal controls. So let's start here. The success of any business enterprise depends on an effective system of internal control. Internal control refers to the company's plans to encourage adherence to company's policies and procedures, promote operational efficiency, minimize errors and theft, and enhance the reliability and accuracy of accounting data. From a financial accounting perspective, the focus is on controls intended to improve the accuracy and reliability of accounting information and to safeguard the company's assets. Recall from discussion in Chapter 1 that Section 404 of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act requires companies document their internal controls and assess their adequacy. The Public Company Accounting Oversight Board further requires the auditor to express its own opinion on whether the company has maintained effective internal controls over financial reporting. Many companies have incurred significant costs in an effort to comply with the requirements of Section 404. A framework for designing an internal control system is provi provided by the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations, we call COSO, of the Treadway Commission. Formed back in 1985, the organization is dedicated to improving the quality of financial reporting through, among other things, effective inter internal controls. COSO defines internal controls as a process undertaken by its entity's board of directors, management, and other personnel designed to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of objectives in the following categories. Effectiveness and efficiency of operations, reliability of financial reporting, and compliance with applicable laws and regulations. As cash is the most liquid of all assets, a well-designed and functioning system of internal control must surround all cash transactions. Separation of duties is critical. Individuals that have physical responsibility for assets should not also have access to accounting records. So employees who handle cash should not be involved or have access to accounting records, nor should they be involved in the reconciliation of cash book balances to bank balances. Consider the cash receipt process. Most non-retail businesses receive payment for goods by check received through the mail. An approach to internal control over cash receipts that utilizes separation of duties might include where employee A opens the mail each day and prepares a multi-copy listing of all checks including the amount and payer's name. Employee B takes the checks along with one copy of the listing to the person responsible for depositing the checks in the company's bank account. A second copy of the check listing is sent to the accounting department, where employee C enters receipts into the accounting records. Good internal controls help ensure accuracy, as well as safeguarding against theft. 
The bank generated deposit slip can be compared with the check listing to verify that the amounts received were also deposited. And because the person opening the mail is not the person who maintains the accounting records, it's impossible for one person to steal checks and alter accounting records to cover up their theft. Proper controls for cash disbursements should be designed to prevent any unauthorized payments and ensure that disbursements are re recorded in the proper accounts. Important elements of a cash disbursement control system would include all disbursements other than very small disbursements from petty cash should be made by check. This provides a permanent record of all disbursements. All expenditures should be authorized before a check is prepared. So, for example, a vendor invoice for the purchase of inventory should be compared with the purchase order and receiving report to ensure the accuracy of quantity, price, part numbers, and so on. This process should include verification of the proper ledger accounts to be debited. Checks should be signed only by authorized individuals. Once again, separation of duties is important. Responsibilities for check signing, check writing, check mailing, cash disbursement documentation, and record keeping should be separated when possible. That way, a single person can't write checks to himself and disguise that theft as a payment to an approved vendor. So let's start with a question for you. Which of the following is not an element of good internal control system for cash receipts and disbursements? A. Maintaining a separation of duties. B. Ensuring all checks are signed by authorized individuals. C. Having the most senior employee handle cash disbursements and bank reconciliations or D, make disbursements with checks rather than cash. Hope you got that one. Individuals that have physical responsibility for assets should not also have access to accounting records. Employees who handle cash should not be involved or have access to accounting records, nor should be involved in the reconciliation of cash book balances to bank balances. So we'll begin with our first exercise. The controller of the White Herring Corporation is in the process of preparing the company's year one financial statements. She's trying to determine the correct balance of cash and cash equivalents to be reported as a current asset in the balance sheet. The following items are considered. A. Balances in the company's account at First National Bank, checking 10500 and savings 21,600. Undeposited customer checks of 5,200. Currency and coins on hand, 570. Savings account at East Bay Bank with a balance of 390,000. This account is being used to accumulate cash for future plant expansion. That will happen in year three. E, 40,000 in a checking account at the East Bay Bank. The balance in the account represents a 20% compensating balance for a $200,000 loan with the bank. White Herring may not withdraw the funds until the loan is due in year four. F. U.S. Treasury bills, two-month maturity bills totaling $11,000 and seven-month bills totaling $20,000. Determine the correct balance of cash and cash equivalents to be reported in the current assets section of the current balance sheet and explain the correct classification of the items that are not included. So as we see here, the cash and cash equivalents should include the $10,500 balance in checking and the $21,600 balance in savings, along with the undeposited customer checks and the currency and coins on hand. The U.S. Treasury bills with a two-month maturity may also be included. So our total for cash and cash equivalents total are $48,870. Cash that is restricted in some way 
and not available for current use usually is reported as a non-current asset such as investments in funds or other assets. Restrictions on cash may be informal, arising from management's intent to use a certain amount of cash for a specific purpose. So for example, a company may set aside funds for future plant expansion. This cash, if it's material, should be classified as investments and funds or other assets. Some restrictions are contractually imposed. Debt instruments frequently require the borrower to set aside funds, often referred to as a sinking fund account, for the future payment of debt. In these cases, the restricted cash is classified as non-current investments and or other assets if the debt is classified as non-current. On the other hand, if the liability is current, the restricted cash is also classified as current. Disclosure notes should describe any material restrictions of cash. Banks frequently require cash restrictions in connection with loans or loan commitments. Typically, the borrower is asked to maintain a specified balance in a low interest or non-bearing account at the bank. The required balance usually is some percentage of the committed amount, like 2 to 5 percent. There are these are known as compensating balances because they compensate the bank for granting the loan or for extending the line of credit. So a compensating balance results in the borrower's paying an effective interest rate that's higher than the stated rate on the debt. Suppose that a company borrows $10 million from a bank at an interest rate of 12% such that it pays $1,200,000 per year of interest. If the bank requires a compensating balance of $2 million to be held in a non-interest-bearing account, the company really is borrowing only $8 million, the loan less the compensating balance. This means an effective interest rate of 15%, which is the $1,200,000, Divide, interest divided by the $8 million cash available. So you see that 15% is truly greater than the interest rate it's telling us is 12%. So let's look at a question here. Jenks borrows $13 million from a bank at a 10% rate of interest. The bank requires Jenks to maintain a $3 million compensating balance. What is Jenks' effective interest rate? So as you can see here, if we take the $13 million times 10%, then that's $1,300,000 that's being paid annually. But if we take that $1,300,000 and divide it by the true amount that we are borrowing, which is 10 million, that would show us a 13% effective interest rate. In general, cash and cash equivalents are treated the same under IFRS and GAAP. One difference relates to bank overdrafts, which occur when withdrawals from a bank amount exceed the available bank balance. U.S. GAAP requires the overdrafts typically to be treated as liabilities. But in contrast, IAS number 7 allows bank overdrafts to be offset against other cash accounts when overdrafts are payable on demand and fluctuate between positive and negative amounts as part of the normal cash management program a company uses to minimize its cash balances. For example, Ladonia Company has two cash accounts with the following balances as of December 31st, 2018. Under GAAP, Ladonia's 1231.18 balance sheet would report a cash asset of 300000 and an overdraft current liability of 15000 Under IFRS, Ladonia would report a cash asset of $285,000. Accounts receivable are created when sellers recognize revenue associated with a credit sale. For most products or services, the performance obligation is satisfied at the point of delivery of the product or service, so revenue and the related 
receivables are recognized at the same time. Most businesses provide credit to their customers either because it's not practical to require immediate cash payment or to encourage customers to purchase the company's product or service. Accounts receivable are informal credit arrangements supported by an invoice and normally due in 30 or 60 days after the sale. They almost always are classified as current assets because their normal collection period, even if they're longer than a year, is part of, and therefore less than, the operating cycle of the business. Recognition of accounts receivables fundamentally tied to revenue recognition. Sellers recognize an amount of revenue equal to the amount they are entitled to receive in exchange for satisfying a performance obligation. Sellers allocate the transaction price to the various performance obligations in a contract and then recognize revenue and the corresponding receivable for credit sales when performance obligations are satisfied. Clearly, revenue recognition sorry about that. Clearly, revenue recognition and accounts receivable recognition are related pretty closely. It means that some of the complexities that affect revenue recognition also affect accounts receivable. Well, one potential complexity relates to time value of money. Because credit sales allow a customer to get goods or services now but pay for them in the future, you can view a credit sale as providing a loan in addition to whatever goods or services are included in a contract. Sellers can ignore this financing component when it's not significant, which typically is the case when receivables are due in less than a year. So sellers usually record relatively short-term accounts receivable at the entire amount the seller expects to receive, rather than at the present value of that amount. For longer-term receivables, the financing component is more significant and sellers have to account for it. Another type of complexity relates to variable consideration. Contracts can include some aspect of variable consideration that must be estimated when determining the transaction price and therefore the amount of the receivable. In particular, contracts can allow cash discounts as well as sales returns and allowances. We're going to talk about these in the next. There are two types of discounts that companies commonly offer, trade discounts and cash discounts. Companies frequently offer trade discounts to customers, usually a percentage reduction from the list price. So for example, a manufacturer might list a machine part as $2,500, but sell it to an important customer at a 10% discount. That discount of $250 is reflected by recording the sale at the agreed upon price of $2,250. Trade discounts are not variable consideration. They're simply a way to specify a transaction price. Trade discounts allow a seller to offer different prices without publishing a new catalog, to disguise real prices from competitors, and to give quantity discounts to large customers. However, cash discounts, often called sales discounts, represent reductions in the amount to be paid by a credit customer if the customer makes payment within a specified period of time. A cash discount provides an incentive for quick payment. The amount of a cash discount and the time period within which it's available usually are conveyed by terms like 210 net 30, meaning a 2% discount if paid within 10 days, otherwise the full payment is due in 30 days. Cash discounts are variable consideration because there's uncertainty about whether a customer will pay quickly enough to qualify for the discount. However, it's usually difficult for a seller to estimate the amount of discount that will be taken with every other sale. Therefore, sellers use two methods in practice that simplify the process of recording cash discounts, the gross method and the net method. With both methods, sales revenue ends up being reduced by only those discounts that are actually taken. So using the gross method, we initially record the revenues and related receivable at the full $20,000 price. Using the net method, we record revenue and the related accounts receivable at the agreed upon price less the 2% discount 
yielding 19,600, which is 2% of 20,000 less the $20,000. Now, under the gross method, if the payment occurs within the discount period, the $280 discount is recorded as a debit to an account called sales discounts. This is a contra account to sales revenue and is deducted from sales revenue to derive a net sales number that's reported in the income statement. If used under the net method, if payment occurs within the discount period, we simply debit cash and credit accounts receivable for the amount we received. Under the gross method, if payment occurs after the discount period, cash is simply increased and accounts receivable decreased by the gross amount originally recorded. Using the net method, if payment occurs after the discount period, the discount not taken is recorded to an account called sales discounts forfeited. This account is added to sales revenue to calculate net sales revenue. Conceptually, sales discounts forfeited is similar to interest revenue, since it is extra revenue received because a receivable is outstanding for a longer period of time. In this case, customers forfeited $120, 6,000 times 2% of cash discounts. Both methods get us to the same place from the perspective of total revenue and therefore total net income recognized. Let's just get us to that place in slightly different ways based on these methods. So which of the following is not true record regarding recording cash discounts? The gross method records sales discounts taken when payment occurs during the discount period. The net method records sales discounts not taken as sales discounts forfeited. C. Net sales revenue is higher under the gross method than under the net method. Or D. Net sales revenue is the same under the gross method and the net method. Well, I hope you got this right. The correct answer is C. This is not true. Net sales revenue is the same under both methods. As you see, as we showed in the previous slide. The $20,000 minus the $280 is the gross method, which is $19,600. Plus the $120 gives us then the net method. So which method is correct? Well, sales revenue and the corresponding accounts receivable should be stated at the amount of consideration the seller expects to be entitled to receive. The net method typically better reflects that amount because the discount is a savings that prudent customers are unwilling to forgo. To appreciate the size of that savings, reconsider the example we just saw. In order to save $2, the customer must pay $98 20 days earlier than otherwise due. Effectively investing $98 to earn $2 a rate of return of 2.04% for a 20-day period. To convert this 20-day rate to an annual rate, we would multiply the 365 divided by 20, which would be the 2.04% rate times 365 divided by 20, which ultimately is giving us a 37.23% effective interest rate. Would you like to earn a return of over 37%? You can see why customers try to take the discount if they're able to. That's why recording the receivable net of the discount is more accurate. Still, even though the net method is more correctly conceptual, both methods are used in practice because many sellers prefer to record receivables at a gross and then make downward adjustments at the time payment is made. The dollar value of the difference between methods usually is viewed as immaterial. So let's look at exercise 7-4. Marker has the following cash balances. First bank, 151000 Second bank, minus 11400 Third bank, 25100 
fourth bank minus 6,500. We're to prepare the current assets and current liabilities of section, section of markers, year one balance, assuming gap, and then we'll do it assuming IFRS. So in gap, the assets are shown as current assets, the cash, but the overdrafts are shown in the liability section under gap. However, under IFRS, we would show the net balance as current assets, and there would not be any liabilities. Next, let's look at the next exercise here. <laughs> Lampsey Company, a manufacturer of electric equipment, sold 100 units to Radius Company on January 17th, year one. The units have a list price of $200 each, but Radius was given a 10% trade discount. The terms of the sale are 210 net 30. We'll prepare the journal entry to record the sale on January 17th, ignoring cost of goods sold, and the collection on January 26th of year one, assuming the gross method of accounting for cash discounts is used. Then we'll prepare it, assuming the gross method of accounting for cash discounts is used for the, the February 15th, and then we'll do the both using the net method. So in the first method, where we use the gross method on January 17th, we'll take the number of units times the price gives us our 20,000. But the 90% the um, trade discount is just taken off the top to show our sales here is 18,000. Under the gross method, we will record the receivables and the revenue net. So we're going to show the accounts receivable of 18,000, our sales revenue, 18,000. Then on January 26th, when the cash comes in, we're going to show the cash of 17640 our sales discounts of 360 and then we will credit our accounts receivable for the full 18000 now by using <clears throat> the net amount then what we would do is we would show our accounts receivable 18 i'm sorry this is to prepare the journal entries collection on February 15th. So on February 15th, we'll show the cash and then we'll show the accounts receivable. They did not take the discount, therefore we would not adjust anything. But under the net method, then we're going to show the accounts receivable net of the discount We'll show our sales revenue also net of the discount. When cash comes in within the time period, we then show a debit to our cash of 17640 and a credit to our receivable. But in this method, if they do not take the discount, then we would show a debit to cash of the full amount. Our accounts receivable would be credited for the amount we show of 17640 and then we will credit a sales discount forfeited. Customers frequently are given the right to return merchandise they purchase. When practical, a customer might be given a special price reduction as an incentive to keep the merchandise purchased. We use the term sales returns to refer to these items and other adjustments. Sales returns are common in industries like food products, publishing, and retailing. Sales returns are a form of variable consideration. Because products might be returned or prices adjusted, there is uncertainty as to the final amount the seller will be entitled to receive, which we would call the seller's consideration. Recognizing returns only at the time they happen might cause receivables, revenue, and profits to be overstated in the period the sale is made and understated in the return period. So for example, 
Assume merchandise is sold to a customer for $10,000 in December of 2018, the last month in the selling company's fiscal year, and that the merchandise costs $6,000. The company would recognize gross profit of $4,000 in 2018. If all the merchandise is returned in 2019, after financial statements for 2018 are issued, gross profit would be overstated in 2018 and then understated in 2019 by 4000 bucks, Assets at the end of 2018 will also be overstated by $4,000 because a $10,000 receivable would be recorded instead of $6,000 in inventory. To avoid this problem, the seller should estimate sales returns and reduce both revenue and accounts receivable accordingly. Technically, the seller should estimate returns at the time of sale and adjust the transaction price at that time to reflect, to reflect its estimate in the variable consideration it's going to receive. However, it's impractical for most sellers to estimate returns every time they make a sale. For that reason, sellers typically account for returns as they actually occur and then make an adjusting entry at the end of the accounting period to reflect any remaining they expect to occur in the future. That is the approach we are demonstrating. So during 2018, its first year of operations, the Hawthorne Manufacturing Company sold merchandise for $2 million. This merchandise cost Hawthorne $1,200,000, which is 60% of the selling price. Industry experience indicates that 10% of all sales will be returned which in this case equals $200,000. Customers returned $130,000 of sales during 2018. Hawthorne uses a perpetual inventory system. First, Hawthorne would record the sales made during the year. It would debit cash in case of cash sales or accounts receivable in the case of sales made on account for $2 million. Companies using the perpetual inventory system, so it will record the increase or decrease in inventory each time any changes occur in the account. Since the cost of merchandise sold is $1,200,000, inventory is reduced by $1,200,000 and cost of goods sold is increased by $1,200,000. Now, in the period of sale, Hawthorne recognized returns that occur in that period, debiting a contra revenue account to reduce revenue for returns. If the customer previously had paid for the returned items, cash is reduced to repay the customer. Otherwise, accounts receivable is reduced. Hawthorne also reduces cost of goods sold and increases inventory to reflect the fact that $78,000 of inventory had been returned. At the end of the period, Hawthorne also records a refund liability for its estimate of additional cash that it will have to refund in the future. For credit sales with the receivable still outstanding, Hawthorne instead might credit an allowance for sales returns account. This allowance is the contra account to accounts receivable that reduces the net balance of accounts receivable for Hawthorne's estimate of future returns. Regardless of whether cash has been collected or receivable is outstanding, the 2018 income statement reports net sales revenue of $1,800,000, which is gross sales revenue of $2 million, reduced by actual and estimated returns of $200,000, the 130 plus the 70. Also, the 42000 of inventory expected to be returned in 2019 is included as an asset, inventory estimated returns, in Hawthorne's 2018 balance sheet, even though the actual merchandise still belongs to the customer, because ownership of the merchandise is expected to revert back to Hawthorne. As a result, 2018 cost of goods sold equals $1,080,000 which is $1,200,000 reduced by the cost of actual and estimated returns of $120,000, which is again the $78,000 plus the $42,000.
Finally, when the, estimate, the estimated returns do occur in 2019, the company either pays cash or reduces accounts receivable for $70,000 and reduces the liability or allowance created earlier. At the same time, it increases inventory and reduces inventory. Estimated returns for $42,000, the cost of the returned inventory. Note that the sales revenue and cost of goods sold are not affected in 2019. Accrual of estimated returns in 2018 made sure that their effects would be reflected only in the 2018 income statements and financial statements. So what happens if Hawthorne's estimate of future returns is wrong such that returns end up being more or less than the 70000 well, we don't revise prior period's financial statements to reflect the new estimate. Instead, we adjust the accounts to reflect the change in estimated returns with any effect on income recognized in the period in which the adjustment is made. So, this example, like in our slide here, only 60,000 of 2018 sales were returned in 2019 instead of the 70,000 Hawthorne anticipated. Also, suppose that the estimated returns relate to outstanding accounts receivable and that Hawthorne estimates that no more returns will occur. In that case, the allowance for sales returns still has a pre-adjustment balance of $10,000 remaining from the 2018 sales. Also, inventory estimated returns still has a pre-adjustment balance of 6000 the 60% times 10,000 remaining from the 2018 sales. Hawthorne makes adjustments that remove the remaining 2018 balance from the allowance for sales returns and inventory estimated returns. Those adjustments also increase net sales revenue by reducing sales returns and cost of goods sold in 2019, the period in which the change in estimate occurs. Let's take a concept question here. $5 store sells merchandise for cash. It began 2018 with a refund liability of zero, made sales of one million during 2018, which cost FDS 600,000 or 60 percent, estimates that one percent of all sales will be returned, and experiences eight thousand dollars of returns during 2018. When accruing its estimate of remaining returns at the end of 2018, FDS would debit sales returns and credit the refund liability for $18,000, $10,000, $8,000, or $2,000. Remember, the estimated return would be the million times 1% would be 10,000. The estimated returns to accrue is the difference between what we estimate of 10 minus the amount of returns that have taken place or 2. So there we would debit our sales return and credit our refund liability. Next, $5 stores sells merchandise for cash. It's beginning 2018 with a refund liability of zero, made cash sales of a million, which cost the company 600000 estimates 1% of the sales will be returned, and it experiences 8000 in returns during the year. When accruing its estimate for remaining returns at the end of 2018, FDS would include debit, would in debit inventory, estimated returns, and credit cost of goods sold for the 6000 the 48 the 12 or the 0 so in this case it would be for $1200 the estimated returns again is 10000 divided the um, or subtracted by what has um, in fact been returned gives us a $2000 estimate then what we would do is we would show the 2,000 times 60% is the estimated cost of returns to accrue, which would be the inventory. 
So we would debit our returns, we would credit our refund liability, but we would also then debit our inventory for estimated returns and credit our cost of goods sold. So let's look at an exercise 7-6. Maxwell Company manufactures automobile tires. On January 15th of year one, the company sold 1,000 tires to the Axon car company for $40 each. The terms of the sale were 310 net 30. Maxwell uses the gross method of accounting for cash discounts. So our job is to prepare the journal entry to record the sale on July 15th and the collection on July 23rd and then to prepare the journal entries to record the sale on July 15th and collection on August 15th. So in the first scenario we would debit accounts receivable for 40,000 which is the 1,000 tires at 40 bucks each we would credit our sales revenue. Then when the cash came in within the 10 days we would debit the cash of 38.8, debit our sales discount to then credit our accounts receivable. Now in the next step they didn't take the discount so step one is the same and then with step two since the discount wasn't taken the debit for cash is for the full amount and we would credit our accounts receivable. Exercise 7-7. Seven, seven. Now exercise 7-7 seven, seven, again they sold tires but they're using now the net method of accounting for cash discounts. So in this scenario we're going to debit our accounts receivable using the net method planning on they will be taking the discount. So we debit our accounts receivable for 38.8, credit our sales revenue for 38.8. When they pay during the discounted period, we debit our cash and credit our receivable. But in the next portion, we're going to show that they are not going to take the discount. But under the net method, we still show the receivables and sales discount in such a way. But then when they do not take it and they pay the full amount, we then show a credit to interest revenue because this is the collection on account after the, collect the discount period is gone. Now with exercise 7A, let's take a look at this one. Delfax manufa Manufacturing allows its customers to return merchandise for any reason up to 90 days after delivery and receive a credit to their accounts. All of Delfax's sales are for credit, though no cash. The company began year one with an allowance for sales returns of 200000 During year one, Delfax sold merchandise on account 12 million. This merchandise cost Delfax 70% of the sales price or 8,400,000. During the year customers returned $400,000 in credit sales for credit. Sales returns estimated to be 5% of sales are recorded as an adjusting entry at the end of the year. So we're going to prepare the entry to record the merchandise returns and the year-end adjusting entry for estimated returns. And then what is the amount of the year-end allowance for sales returns after the adjusting entry is recorded? So we will debit our sales returns for 400,000 because during the year the customer returned 400,000 sales. We will credit our accounts receivable for 400,000. Our inventory, which is 70% of the sales price, needs to be debited for 280000 and we reduce our cost of goods sold by the same amount. Now, in this scenario, our estimated sales returns, 5%, times our $12 million, 
means our estimated returns through the year would be 600000 So our sales returns initially to record 600000 minus the 400000 that was returned gives us our sales returns a debit of 200000 and a credit allowance for sales returns 200000 we're then going to show the inventory on the estimated returns for 140 and credit our cost of goods sold for 140. What is the amount of the year-end allowance for sales returns after the adjusting entry is recorded? Well, we began with 200,000 we add our year and estimate minus our actual returns gives us an ending balance of 400,000 in our allowance account. Being entitled to receive payment doesn't necessarily mean the seller will be paid for it. Credit losses or bad debts are an inherent cost of granting credit. How should we account for the fact that not every account receivable is likely to be received? A simple approach to recognizing bad debt that is not allowed by GAAP is to wait until a particular account is deemed uncollectible and write it off at that time. So for example, if a customer goes bankrupt and it becomes clear that a $15,000 account receivable won't be collected, the following journal entry could be recorded under the direct write-off method. A shortcoming of the direct write-off method is that it overstates the balances in accounts receivable in the periods prior to the write-off because it fails to anticipate that some accounts receivable are not going to be collected. Also, it distorts net income by postponing recognition of any bad debt expense until the period in which the customer actually fails to pay even though some bad debts expense was predictable before that time. These conceptual problems are why the direct write-off method isn't allowed for financial reporting purposes, unless the amount of bad debts is not material. However, the direct write-off method is required for income tax purposes for most companies. GAAP requires use of the allowance method whenever the amount of bad debts is material. Under the allowance method, companies use the contra account allowance for uncollectible accounts to reduce the carrying value of accounts receivable to the amount of cash they expect to be collected. Both the carrying value and the amount of the allowance typically are shown on the face of the balance sheet. For example, here we see how Johnson & Johnson, the large pharmaceutical company, reported accounts receivable in its comparative balance sheet for 2015 and 2014. Johnson and Johnson's balance sheet communicates that as of year end 2015 it had net accounts receivable of 10,734 and an allowance for doubtful counts accounts of 268 which implies a gross accounts receivable of 10,734 plus the 268 or 11,002. Now under the allowance method, bad debt expense is not recognized when specific accounts are written off. Rather, bad debt expense is recognized earlier when the allowance is created and subsequently adjusted to re reflect new sales and changes in customers' credit quality. Later, when a specific account receivable is deemed uncollectible, both the allowance and the specific account receivable are reduced to write off the receivable. So an example will clarify how this allowance method works. Assume that Hawthorne Company's main company started operations in 2018. It had sales of 1,200,000 and collections of 895,000 leaving a balance of 305000 in accounts receivable as of December 31, 2018. 
Now, recognizing allowance for uncollectible accounts into the first year, Hawthorne's analysis indicates it expects to collect $280,000 of its accounts receivable, so it must establish an allowance for uncollectible accounts of $25,000, which is the 305 minus the 280. Hawthorne establishes the necessary allowance with the journal entry shown here. Bad debt expense, $25,000. Allowance for uncollectible accounts, a credit for $25,000. The balances in accounts receivable of three hundred five, and the contra asset allowance for uncollectible amounts, twenty-five, dollars offset to carry receivables at a net amount of two hundred eighty dollars on the balance sheet. Of course, at this point, Hawthorne doesn't know which particular accounts receivable would be uncollectible. If it could predict it perfectly, then it wouldn't have to had made those sales anyway to begin with. Hawthorne only can record an estimate of the amount of uncollectible accounts for its outstanding receivables. That estimate both reduces net income through bad debt expense and it also reduces the carrying value of Hawthorne's asset accounts receivable. Be sure to understand that the amount in this journal entry is just a plug that's determined by the difference between the pre-adjustment balance and the necessary post-adjustment balance in the allowance. I think that's one of the hardest things for people to get. We record this journal entry as a plug so we make sure we have the right figures in there. So a concept question for you. Green Valley Steel had sales of $1 million and collections of $760,000 leaving a balance of 240000 in accounts receivable as of December 31, 2018. Analysis indicates it expects to collect 200000 of its accounts receivable. How would it set up an allowance for uncollectible accounts? A. Debit accounts receivable for 40 and credit bad debts for 40. B. Debit bad debt expense for 40 and credit allowance for uncollectible accounts for 40. C. Debit allowance for uncollectible accounts of 40 and credit accounts receivable for 40. Or D. Debit allowance for uncollectible accounts of 40 and credit bad debts for 40. Remember, expenses are a debit and we're going to credit an allowance to allow us to keep a true net balance going, but then to write them off when in fact we know they occur. So the 240 outstanding receivables minus the 200,000 anticipated collections gives us a $40,000 allowance for those uncollectible accounts. We're going to stop here and move on with part two of this lecture coming up.